Hi, and welcome to Different Leaf, a show for new and experienced cannabis consumers. I'm Britt Smith. This episode, in honor of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we're learning about the role of ganja in communities that hail from South Asia, also known as the Desi community. From Bangladesh to India to Sri Lanka, the ganja plant has been incorporated into South Asian religious ceremonies and health practices for centuries. In fact, cannabis itself is thought to have originated in that region of the world between the mountains of Nepal and Afghanistan. You may have heard of the Sanskrit word kush used in modern cannabis strain names or bang, which is a mixture of ganja buds and leaves that has been added to food and drink for thousands of years in the Indian subcontinent. Given its long and well-established use as a medicine and its major significance in religions like Hinduism and Sikhism, I wanted to know more about how cannabis consumption is received in today's Desi families, how British colonization changed the way weed was treated in South Asia, and what the future looks like for the relationship between the Desi community and the ganja plant. Our guests today are Shivrali Patel and Yogi Maharaj, two of the founders of the Desi Cannabis Collective, the first women-founded nonprofit dedicated to reclaiming, educating, and empowering the South Asian diaspora about cannabis and hemp. Hi, everyone. My name is Yogi Maharaj, and I'm one of the co-founders at Desi Cannabis Collective. Hi, everyone. My name is Jirali Patel, and I'm one of the co-founders at Desi Cannabis Collective. Very nice to meet both of you. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. So let's start with a bit on your backgrounds. Shirali, where did you grow up? Yes, uh, born and raised in the U.S., in New Jersey, actually, is where my parents decided to uh, emig- immigrate to from India. Nice. And Yogi, how about you? Where are you from? I am from the Bay Area. I was born and raised in Hayward, California, and this is where I've been my whole life. Nice. I used to live out in the Bay Area, too. I went to school out there. Nice. Yeah, dope little place. I like that area of the world. So both of you were brought up and raised and schooled in the U.S. Tell me a little bit about how your families view the world of cannabis that you've now moved into. (laughs) So I can start. Initially, you know, when I told them that I was getting into the, I actually didn't even tell them I was getting into the industry because in New Jersey or the state legalized medical cannabis back in 2010 or end of 2010 going into 2011. And I was still in, uh, I was, I think I was graduating undergrad that year. And I remember being excited and telling my parents like medical is happening in New Jersey, you know, eventually we're going to get it legal. And they were just like, you know, it's marijuana number one and it's a drug. And we don't really know what you're talking about. And so for a couple of years, I had to be really quiet about what it is that I was doing until I decided that, no, this is an industry where I belong and I love this plant and it's time for them to accept it. Even if they can't be supportive, at least acknowledge that this is what I'm going to do with my life. Um, And so eventually they started realizing how much I cared about the plant and then seeing for themselves firsthand the medical benefits of the plant is really what created a full turn for them. And now they're so supportive. Uh, They try to, you know, my mom's always reading articles about it. My dad loves it now. They don't partake (laughs) yet, but I hope to get them on that side. How about you, Yogi? Did you have a similar sort of stigma in your family growing up? Yes, definitely. I had a similar stigma. I started consuming cannabis at a young age and my parents were very against it. But as legalization happened in California and I was able to find a career in it, they'd become more supportive. I think it was when my grandma had had a very serious heart attack and she started consuming cannabis, guided by my older sister, where they started being more supportive of it. My mom uses it more, a little bit more frequently than my father does. She loves consuming CBD products. But there was a huge stigma for many, many, many years. And I think it was when it was like 10 years after I had started consuming cannabis where they finally started accepting that this is what she's going to do. This is like we were meant for this, just like she said. So let's talk a bit about how marijuana is rooted in Asian cultures, because there's been this huge change over the decades, over the centuries, really, of what 
cannabis is seen as in the world, especially in the Desi community. And for those that don't know, because I had to look this up, what does Desi mean? Desi means anyone from the South Asian diaspora. So Desi in Hindi means like a land, the land, the motherland. And Desi is people of, of those land. And before it used to mean those who were from South Asia, who were in South Asia. But as the British took over uh, India, they started exporting us to different places across the world. And those people became known as Desis as well. So it it's not just those who are from South Asia, but anyone who was who has roots to the motherland in South Asia. And let's talk about British colonization. Obviously, I'm straight from London. Um, so this is a history that I never learned, of course, because why would the British schooling system teach me about all of these atrocities that they had done? But really, the change in what cannabis was to the Indian diaspora has changed because of colonization. Can we talk a little bit about what cannabis marijuana meant to the South Asian diaspora before colonization and then sort of after colonization? What was the original use of cannabis in those parts of the world? You know, originally cannabis was mentioned in our Ved. So I guess the, the English pronunciation is Vedas, but it's actually the Ved and the Vedao. And in the Athar Ved, it's listed as one of the five sacred plants that we use for, for medicine, for wellness, for spirituality. It's known as Vijaya or Soma in the ancient texts, which go back four or five thousands, even more years old. So ancient prehistoric usage of this plant has been happening in our motherland. And so for thousands of years, this plant has been used in our country for plant medicine and for spirituality, and even in celebration with certain festivals. So Shivratri, which we just celebrated, or Holi, you know, these festivals are incomplete without the consumption of bong, which is a byproduct of cannabis flower. And so it's been ingrained in our culture, but unfortunately, when you know the British invaded and colonization took place, it really uprooted the entire basis of what this plant has been utilized for, and it went from you know plant medicine in in pharmacology in India to now it's a restricted form of medicine, and it's it's only eventually when the British did invade, you know, they said keep growing the cannabis flower and growing the hemp stock, and then we're going to export it out to the rest of the world. And so they were indenturing our people back home. And so they were taking advantage for the, for the plant as a commodity now. And, if, and after it, you know, we won back our independence, it just left the country in shambles. And the last thing that they were going to focus on was the plant, right? They had to rebuild infrastructure. And, and this wasn't that long ago. 1947 is when we won independence, right? That's not even 100 years later. And so we're coming back to our roots and finally acknowledging and accepting that this is Ayurveda, this is medicine. And that's why at the federal level, cannabis still remains legal for medicinal purposes in limited sectors, and it's still state by state, you know, subjugation. But we've come a long way from, from ancient times. I couldn't believe when I read that up until like 1985, it was sold in government shops in India. And, and like when it was made illegal, by the British, a lot of it was because they wanted to start importing scotch. They wanted some other way that they could make money. And they also had all these folks who knew so much about agriculture and, and cannabis and farming that they could ship them off. It's like the entire story of cannabis in India and Pakistan and around that part of the world has just changed course so drastically and kind of horrifically because of all this enslavement hundreds of years ago, and we're still feeling it now. So because it was it, it was formally seen as a medicine and, and some sort of like a remedy, and it was used in religion, and then it was illegalized, I, I guess that's when sort of the, the view of cannabis started changing and the stigma started coming in. Yogi, can you talk a little bit about how it is now viewed in Asian households, like in, in families as sort of more of a drug? Yes, cannabis has been systemically criminalized in our community. It was linked to insanity. Um, they tried, the British tried to link it to insanity. And we're still living with those effects now. People are very scared. People being our elders, our elders are very scared that it is a drug because for many centuries, our elders were locked up in an insane asylums for the use of cannabis. Um, and it's very, 
reflective of what the system is now and today, like, you know, where people are criminalized for cannabis because of whatever reason, because it's a schedule one drug. And so I think a lot of parents, uh, a lot of elders live with that fear. A lot of people in America who are South Asian are criminalized for cannabis use as well as in the past. So I feel like there's a long history of trauma, just like in the Black community, there's a long history of trauma where this plant has been utilized to as a weapon against us, against our communities. And so that's exactly what I feel like our elders live in fear of today, is that we will be criminalized, that we will be, go to jail, that our futures will be ruined because so many of our futures and so much of our culture was ruined because of because of the British essentially wanting control of the plant, wanting to make a profit off of it. And we didn't let them, the South Asian community, South Asia had their own illicit market that was born after the British tried to force us to pay licenses for cultivation, for distribution. And so it's like, it's all a huge cycle. And it's just, there has been no healing. Just like Shirali said, we had our freedom. Our country was left in shambles. and there's a lot of work to be redone to to build something from the ground up again is one thing but to rebuild an entire system of ideologies and spirituality is a whole other battle folks today are finding that it, there's many different ways that cannabis plays a part in their lives and spirituality is obviously a big one for the south asian communities how do you think that the use of cannabis has changed through spirituality since we've seen it go from legal to illegal to sort of semi-legal again. How have you witnessed that, that change with how it's used in religion? There is a subsect of individuals that have continued to use this plant for spiritual and religious reasons, regardless of what's been happening um, in the mainstream. And so I'm referring to the Aghoris or, you know, the Brahmins or the any Rishi or um, sage, I would say, that has been a devotee to Shiv or Shiva, because Shiv is the god in our culture that's created this this plant, right? Or the energy, I wouldn't say god, but Shiva is more of an energy that we all identify as, and we all come from that same source energy. And so I think that those individuals to this day have been consuming this plant. So before prayers, before meditations, before yogic um, exercises, or just even before breathing, right? They're consuming this plant um, from a chillum. They're using the hash, the resin, um, natural-based uh, forms. And so even to when I go back to the motherland in certain parts, when I go visit the temples, I will see them sitting outside under the bunion tree consuming, right? Because that's how they invoke the gods and it's still used mainstream wise yogi knows a lot more so i'll let her elaborate but when there's when we have festivals with holy for example that's when the whole nation or anybody that identifies will think it's okay on this specific day to consume because we're celebrating but my belief is if it's okay this day it's okay every day because what makes this day any different if we're especially if we're praising our gods and so it's within our culture so i think that there's just this subsect of those who choose to continue using it spiritually and have been for so many years and centuries. And then you have the mainstream individuals where they use it because they think on this specific religious day, we should use it. But um, I think there's a lot of people on the regular, like Yogi and I, we, I'm sure, you know, we consume before we, we pray or before we meditate because it's just, it's part of our connection to the spirit realm. Yeah. I also feel like um, cannabis was used like medicinally. If you look at um, I think it's the Atharva Veda, but there were about 108 different formulations that contain cannabis that were used for different ailments. There were things that you ingested. There were things that you used in your body. Farmers used to use it. Farmers, my dad said that when he went to visit India, farmers would just rub buds in their hand and scrape off the resin so that they can smoke after a long day because of all the pressure and all the wear that physical labor has on your body. So there are very many spiritual roots that still exist to cannabis, but a lot of a lot of it is what Shirali said, like we only consume on certain festivals. And even then it's very taboo. Like if you try to bring Pong to a temple in, in America, you know, you're going to get looked at a little funny because I know I definitely brought it and people looked at me. 